So how did the Livermore wineries survive prohibition? Well, just, in general, just Livermore in general, not Wente Vineyards, but. A, a lot of wineries survived any way they could. Uh, and uh, there is no doubt that uh, more wine went out the back door than uh, was accounted for. But a uh, number of wineries did make sacramental wines for religious purposes. In fact, Kim Cannon Vineyards, our neighbor across the street, was basically founded to make sacramental wines uh, for the Archdiocese in San Francisco. And uh, so they continued that uh, process all the way through Prohibition Wente was fortunate enough to be very close associates of Bullyu Vineyards and George de Latour, the owner of Bullyu was a good friend of Herman Wente and he uh, wanted us to make all the white wine we could for him during prohibition. So we were able to keep our vineyards and wine production uh, in full uh, capacity during that period of time. So that when repeal came, uh, we were ready to, our vineyards were still healthy and our winery was full of fresh young wine and we were ready to go back into business. Um, my next question, um, what are the main like varietal differences between the 1800s, 1880s when we started out? We started in 1883, if anyone was curious. Um, 1800s and then when you started it, working for the family business and then now. So what are the three different varietal changes that you've kind of seen throughout the years? Or you haven't seen the 1800s obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, for Wendy Vineyards, our varietals have pretty much been very steady throughout the history of our winery. When um, your great-great-grandfather first um, got to Livermore and uh, purchased an interest in a property on Tesla Road, there was primarily Zinfandel planted, but a lot of other white varieties as well. And he gradually increased his holdings over the years, but stayed with Sauvignon Blanc, Simeon, um, the, the Chardonnay, the premium white varieties. When repeal came and the wine industry went back into production, the grape varieties that were planted during prohibition were primarily those varieties that allowed themselves to be shipped to the East Coast for home winemaking, but did not make really outstanding quality wines. And so we were faced with a situation where um, probably 85% of the vineyards were set up to produce wines that were non-traditional. And it took um, literally 40 years for those varieties to cycle out. To give you an idea, in 1940, 90% of the wines produced from California were fortified dessert wines, meaning sweet wines that had brandy or neutral spirits added to them to fortify them. And that is where the majority of the business w went because that's the resource that was available. The majority of wineries were producing large volumes of sweet fortified dessert wines. There were not very many wineries like Wente Vineyards or Bullyu or Louis Martini or Ingle Nook uh, that went back into the business doing what we did. Our, my great uncle, your great great uncle, Herman Wente, when repeal came and they decided what they were going to do, he said, it's extremely important that we gain the confidence of the consumer and they must have confidence in the producer, the region from where the grapes come from and which grapes they are, which is what instituted his concept of varietal labeling. He said, how can I let them know what's in the bottle? They have to believe in me. They have to believe in the Livermore Valley and they have to know what grapes are in the bottle. So I'm going to say the name of the grape. And so he started varietal labeling and 1932 Sauvignon Blanc was our very first varietal label and it accomplished that, but it was a very slow process. We crushed 800 tons in 1910. It took us until 1960 to crush 800 tons again as a winery. So it took them a long, long time, 30 years to get back from prohibition to where they were in 1910. Wow. Uh, so I have a couple questions coming in. One, they're not necessarily a question, but a lot of people are remembering the gray Riesling. I always hear about it. Um, something I think you could talk about 
a little bit, and then after that, is there a clone or particular rootstock you can count on for good fruit output? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, All it doesn't. Right. All right, so two questions coming at me. Uh, gray Riesling. Yeah. So gray, gray Riesling, Riesling. We're not drinking that, folks. So right, can, right. And gray Riesling, as you look at the. Light. records on gray Riesling. It was uh, uh, sporadically planted prior to prohibition in a whole number of uh, vineyards throughout Northern California. And it it is now known, and they didn't know it then, um, as a variety that is called Trousseau Gris um, through the, the ability of DNA analysis now. Uh, then it was thought to be either Trousseau Gris, Chausse Gris, and some people called it Gray Riesling, and it sort of went by three different names. Um, we started producing Gray Riesling after the prohibition, really uh, beginning to label it as a varietal in the early 1940s, and it, it particularly caught on in the late 1950s and early 1960s, and in fact, Riesling was the most popular variety of the 1960s, for those of you who are old, old as I am and remember. But um, uh, anyway, uh, in uh, 1992, I think it was, or maybe a little bit before, 88, I think 92, we stopped making it. Around 1988, um, we, the federal government said, you can no longer call it Gray Riesling because we now know it's true, so Gris, so we'll give you five years to finish uh, your inventory and then either call it true, so Gris or don't ship Gray Riesling anymore. Now, if you go around the marketplace, there are a few producers of Trousseau Gris. They're wonderful wines. You check them out. They're really fun. Um, on on rootstocks, there, yeah. there, is, root no, there is no miracle uniform answer to rootstocks. It so depends on the soil that you're um, planting, the, the climate that you're planting it in, the variety that you're going to graft on it, and what kind of wine that you're targeting to make. Are you targeting to make a $10 wine with a big volume? We are targeting to make a $100 wine with a little tiny bit of production and, and a huge intensity. Uh, it's going to totally change your uh, decision on rootstock uh, and, uh, and follows the, the sort of logical course. Okay, Dad. Another question that's come in. Who's your favorite daughter? Quick. Jordan. <laughs> I love them all just like I love all my wines. <laughs> so I think we've done a lot of talking um, and I want to make sure we get to all the wines. So um, dad, why don't you pour yourself or drink a little bit of the morning fog um, Chardonnay? You, you have been good. I just switched. I just made Nikki get me a glass. <laughs> That's what she's here for is to get my wine really. So dad, I'm challenging you to give us a 30 second briefing on what is the significance of Chardonnay for the Wendy family. 30 seconds. I know you got it. 30 seconds. Why 30 I'll seconds? tell you, I'll We're tell you, really fast, so. I'll tell you right now that, that we started, plant, we planted our first Chardonnay in 1908 after repeal came and we started varietal labeling and really put the focus on Chardonnay because we needed to produce uh, enough grapes for each variety. We loved Chardonnay because it really allows the winemaker to style a wine with a wide range of appeals so that you can go completely unoaked to partially oaked to heavily oaked and have all these wonderful different styles. And I'm waving my hands around like an Italian, but I'm going to drink some Chardonnay. That is amazing. So one of my favorite things about our Chardonnay and what I think makes us so special to, to be a part of Chardonnay's history is that our great grandfather Ernest, um, when he was planting with his father, the Chardonnay block in two, uh, 1908 and then again in 1912 um, and then continuing how he grew this block was he went through with his dad and he tasted berries and he looked at the vines and the healthy vines and the berries that tasted the best. He marked those vines at the base and then would go on in the winter time when the vines were dormant and take some of the, the long shoots is what we call them, but it's the green vegetative growth that then turns into woody material once dormancy hits. 
He would cut one of those off and put it in the ground. And that's literally how you propagate a vine. But he was only propagating the vines that he thought had the best flavor characteristics as well as the best uh, physiological characteristics. So, you know, vines that looked really pretty, but also tasted really good. So that's how we were able to kind of craft the Chardonnay that you have in your glass today, because it does come from descendants of our Wente heritage uh, selection. So it's a pretty fun little add on to what he said. He is, he's great, but you know, I think I got the little spice on in there. The spice, <laughs> the spice. <laughs> I'm the youngest dog. I don't know how. <laughs> So um, I love the morning the fog Chardonnay, 50% barrel fermented, 50% stainless steel, beautiful balance, great fruit, great toasty oak, beautiful vanilla, great wine. And uh, it is a great wine. It really is. I just saw the went to not only all over California. I don't know if you know, but about they, we think 75% of all California Chardonnay has roots back to our property, which is pretty exciting and cool. Um, but also, it is grown in South Africa, Australia, and Chile. So kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that comes with being uh, around for years. Uh, We've been around so, a long time, around the block. Absolutely. Um, uh, Nikki's picking out a question. I did see a question, though, from someone on the feed asking so we were well known for kind of our white wines our riesling chardonnay at an early period how did we really delve into the cabernets and the red wines how did we you know take that dive well we we continuously did produce red wines uh throughout our our history um but our white wines were more well known for a number of years starting in sort of the late 1930s, we uh, had a co-marketing agreement with Louis Martini uh, up until the late 1980s. And Louis Martini was famous for his red wines and Wente uh, was happy to be the white wine component of that marketing agreement. While we both, uh, we made some reds and they made some whites, um, it really sort of established a reputation for us each. Um, but uh, we've always been very proud of our red wines. And uh, when we left Louis Martini's marketing agreement in the late 80s, we really started to put the focus on our Cabernets, Pinot Noirs, uh, Petit Syrahs, and other things. And um, uh, I think they've excelled since. At one of in Ohio tried to grow the clone, but it was too cold of a climate is a comment that I see here. So we have Suzanne would like to know what Phil's favorite wine is. What's your favorite wine, Dad? Mm. The same as my favorite daughter. I love them all. I, love that. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that my dad. Us that you always start with a glass of white wine or rosé, and then you move on to a red wine. So you can have multiple wines in a night. In moderation. <laughs> in moderation. A gl one glass each. <laughs> okay. Can Phil? Or taught them that. Yeah. Can Phil talk about how the Wente clone grows in different climates? What's the difference between North Coast and Central Coast for the Wente clone? Oh, we have great examples of that. To uh, trying to keep it uh, a relatively short answer, and I'll I'll try to talk fast. Um, there is multiple variations of Wente selections out there, um, and a lot of people refer to the Wente clone, which um, is sort of a misnomer. So there are some certified heat treated clones disseminated from the University of California's Foundation Plant Service, uh, particularly clone four and five that have wide distribution that were sourced uh, from the original Wente selections. Um, a clone is a single vine source replicated uh, uh, to a multiple vine uh, vineyard. Uh, most of the stock out there that people talk about as Wente clones are selections that people made coming to the Wente vineyards, picking a number of vines and then going and planting those uh, and regenerating them in their own vineyards. So uh, clone four and clone five, uh, there are some people who feel they don't do really well in cold climates, but then if you take some of the um, original Linty selections, I think they do really well in cold climates. They're very low yielding. They ripen early. Um, uh, so I would say try the Winty selection 2A. 
So uh, we have a and question. About, before we move on to Charles Omar, last Chardonnay question, Reba Ranch versus Morning Fog. In a, in a big, broad stroke sense, Reba Ranch is from Arroyo Seco in Monterey County, uh, about 120 miles south of Livermore. Uh, Morning Fog is from the Livermore Valley in Alameda County. And uh, so the two, the two viticultural districts yield quite different flavors. Um, secondly, Reba Ranch is essentially 100% barrel fermented and Morning Fog is 50% barrel fermented. So a little lighter, crisper intention in the style. Yeah, and we, drink them. we drink yes. them both a lot. They'll so say we're all verified Reba Divas. Yes. Um, in a morning fog. All the time. All the time. Constantly in a morning fog. Yeah. Okay, and then our last one is Charles Lamar. Oh, it's really like, oh, we're fine on time. And then and it's yeah, like, we're really trying to keep these to 30 minutes. We're probably going to go a little bit over. If you have to hop off, we get it. It's a Wednesday. You have people to feed, <laughs> exercise to do. But let's chat a little bit about Wetmore. Really quick, I saw a fun question. What's your favorite golf course? People actually stay for 30 minutes. They do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do. They like, they're here for you, Dad. Not of us. of Not course, us. my favorite golf course is the course at Wente Vineyards. Of course. Second favorite. Yeah. Second Jordan, favorite. Jordan would like to know she's also a Reba Diva. Hi, Jor. We love you. We miss you. <laughs> um, I think someone called me you earlier. So you and I, that's the same. <laughs> um, okay, so one right. more, Dad. Give us a rundown on the legend, the myth. The man, the legend, Mr. Charles. Charles Wetmore. Well, I think I touched on quite a bit about Charles early in our half hour, um, but you did, you did. he um, he just was instrumental at insisting that the only way to do winemaking and grape growing was to do it right. Uh, and so we truly honor him for going, getting the introduction to Chateau Margaux, bringing uh, Cabernet clones vines from Margot, planting them in the Livermore Valley, disseminating them around to other growers in California. The University of California Davis Foundation Plant Service selected vines of this heritage that are now clone seven and eight at the university. Uh, and um, it, it's a great legacy. They, they make wonderful wines. Um, Totally in love with this Charles Wetmore Cabernet. I love the structure, the body, the richness, beautiful nose, berries, chocolate. Uh, yeah. So can't say enough about that without uh, getting uh, too esoteric. Well, and so also our Charles Wetmore vineyard is actually planted on uh, Charles Wetmore. Charles Wetmore. Charles. Charles Wetmore. It's confusing, but it's right. Why? Why am I confused? confused. That's right. um, it's on his old property, so where he had his winery as well as where he had his house. And honestly, I would like to build a house there someday because mm -hmm. it is gorgeous. Just down the rolling hills of uh, Wetmore and Arroyo, right on the corner there with the Olivina sign and the olive trees down the middle. That was the Olivina. That was uh, J.P. Smith. Wetmore started down the road farther where the course at Wente Vineyards is and where the, the uh, uh, Wente uh, restaurant, winery, et cetera, is. That was the Cresta Blanca winery founded in 1882. Where was Wetmore's house? Wetmore's house was uh, down in that area. So oh, the Olivina Vineyard was a beautiful estate founded by um, Julius Paul Smith, who made his fortune hauling borax out of Death Valley and then retired to the Livermore Valley and, and uh, planted 600 acres of grapes there at the corner of uh, Arroyo Road in Wetmore and called it Olivina. That is the prettiest vineyard, though. If you've never seen one. <laughs> it has these amazing, gorgeous rolling hills. I, I it's, every, it's when you're driving on your way to our Royal Road property where I tasting lounge and look like the sun's always hitting it just right it takes my breath away um, and it feels pretty magical so it's definitely a sight to see if you've never seen that vineyard or been out um, 
out this way. Sorry, everyone. Uh, a couple of sips of Wetmore wine and it'll make it seem like all the vineyards um, down the Royal Road are Charles Wetmore. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. That's what I need. We also had a comment from Rhonda on Rhonda Wood on Facebook, who's another wonderful Hi, Rhonda. winemaker in Wilmer Valley. <laughs> she wants to know about Cap Franc. I know that's your favorite. I know it's her favorite, huh? Yeah. She wants to know the history of Cap Franc, and she says, "What? Thirty minutes? Why?" Well, you know, and that was my impression. I, I got it. I got to tell you a really interesting thing, Rhonda. Um, when uh, my great grandfather first came to Livermore and uh, started working at the Bernard Vineyard, um, which he then later bought into, there was one acre of Cabernet Franc planted along with the Zinfandel. There was some Mataro, um, there, there was some Merlot, but uh, I found it really interesting that there was one acre of Cabernet Franc. So. Uh, we must have uh, been proportioning that over the years just exactly so. So anyway, Cabernet Franc, wonderful grape variety, classic uh, use in Bordeaux all the way to California, one of Rhonda's favorite varieties, and she uh, has done extremely great things with it over the years. Cabernet Franc, our small lot wine. We do too, so. yeah. And Cabernet Franc just grows really well here in warm enough days that you get it ripe and it's not too green because sometimes it can tend to be green um, but it's a beautiful variety that we have quite a lot of fun these days and a lot of different Livermore wineries are doing some super cool stuff. So I highly recommend that anyone listening who hasn't tried a Livermore Valley Cab Franc goes out there and tries it. They're very good. Um, speaking from experience, I have definitely had one. <laughs> I, I, know Rhonda's, I know Rhonda's poking some fun at me in that over the years I have um, not been a big fan of a couple of, of Cabernet Franc vineyards, but uh, we got rid of those and all of the new Cab Franc vineyards have and the, uh, the right clones and planted in the right places are making wonderful wines. So thanks, Rhonda. Yeah. <laughs> Rhonda also wants to know why it's called Smith Ranch. The Olivina uh, property with the sign that uh, Julius Paul Smith owned uh, is why we call it the Smith Ranch. So we named it after the founder. The Olivina brand name is owned by the Crowhair family uh, who uh, live across in the back of the property and actually make wonderful olive oil. So any of you who have not been out to visit the Crowhair olive uh, mill, they do tastings and, and make wonderful olive oil uh, with the Olivina with the Olivina label. Um, Dad, uh, we have. A what is your favorite food? And then I'm going to add on. Could you just give us a wine pairing for that? <laughs> you know, that's a little bit like saying, "What's my favorite wine?" or "My favorite daughter." Um, but look, let's just pick a great dish. One of the things I really love is a uh, filet of sole, all right? So how about a little filet of sole sauteed with butter, lemon, chardonnay, capers, uh, and then served with uh, Eric Chardonnay to keep the beautiful crisp elegance of it. And, um, and I'm my mouth is watering right now, I'm hungry. Let's have a little filet of sole. And then the next question, I, uh, sorry, I always lean the wrong way. I'm not sure how to get into both pictures. Um, was could we get a tour of your wine cellar? And I'll I'll take this one. My dad's always taught me that if you hold on to wines for too long, they turn into pets, and they're no longer something consumable. They're pets. What? So you got to drink them. Don't keep them in your cellar. That is a terrible analogy. Wait, let me let, don't throw me under the bus. There, I always say. If you're gonna keep wine, make sure you keep enough that you can taste it now and then and make a record of when you think it's at its best and then drink it. If you keep one bottle of wine, that's a pet because oh, you're never okay, gonna sorry. know when that one bottle of wine is perfect. You might like as well drink it. You might as well drink it right now. And try it one every year. Yeah or one every six months, make a note, simple, put a five star system on it. 
Uh, find out where your palate lies. How aged do you like wines? I have so many friends who have collected wines and think that they, they're going to be just awesome. Oh, this is 25 years old. And they open it up and go, oh, my God, it tastes like shoe leather. Um, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it's it, it you have to check what's going on and you have to match it to your preference. Um, not yeah. anybody else. Don't listen to anybody else. It's what you like. But don't keep one bottle. Um, unless you're keeping it for some special reason like a birthday or an anniversary or whatever. Otherwise, you know, if if you have your one bottle of Chateau Margaux and you walk downstairs and pet it every time, it's truly a pet. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> says you actually need to buy a case of, yeah. of wine. I see that. I have. We also got another comment that said, do you guys sell the Cab Franc on the East Coast? And we do sell it on our website, and you can ship to many of the 50 states. I'm not sure all of the 50 state laws, and I didn't. you didn't write a state in there for the comment, but we do ship, and we do run a lot of promotions. So you should check out um, our email list because we'll, we have all these different promotions that come with free shipping or any discounts. So kind of fun to, to join that email list. And the only way to get out is from a little time. Yeah, so, true. Well, I think that that's a super good recap. And thank you guys for joining our live and our fun history lesson with our dad. This dad, thank you so much for joining. I know you're yeah. not big on social media, but um, it is now you great. are. Yeah, now you are. Now, <laughs> now it can't be stopped. So, and um, we're sorry for any feedback or issues with Facebook. We were trying really hard to try it. We muted one and it's just hard when you have the phone and the computer going, but yeah. we tried. Thank I'm you for sorry. bearing with us through technology <laughs> struggles, but um, we are not IT. I appreciate everybody having so much. Uh, I know yeah. it's a struggle we wanted to get through this and uh, I hope we can all do something every day that makes us smile and, and keep having some fun and try to figure out ways to really enjoy life.